Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the master class today. And we have with us Dr. Sri Mukhi. Uh, and today I am raring to ask her a lot of questions on nutrition because she is an expert in that. And nutrition has become the key word now, especially post pandemic. So, Doctor, thank you so much for being with us here today. And uh, would you mind if I just call you Doc throughout the entire interview? Yeah, it's fine. That's a nice uh, sound. It's okay. <laughs> and uh, okay. actually, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here addressing moms. Uh, and uh, thank you for the great opportunity. Absolutely. In fact, by uh, public demand, we have called you because if all parents were very, very eager to know more about nutrition and nutrition, especially yeah. for the young little ones. Yes. Pediatric nutrition is very important. And yeah, all absolutely. moms, uh, yeah, they have, uh, they want always wanted to know and give ideal diet to their child. I think that's the most uh, hot topic. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's begin. Uh, let's start with the first section. Okay. And our section is on creating a rounded diet for your child. So one of the first questions, Doc, that we have got is that uh, how can a balanced diet enriched with essential nutrients serve as a catalyst for brain development in children? Yeah. Uh, uh, the answer is in the question itself, actually. Uh, definitely a healthy, balanced diet definitely enriches the brain because we all know that the brain, 90% of brain growth occurs in the first two years of life. Okay. So we call it first thousand days. The mm -hmm. first thousand days is nothing but the pregnancy plus the first two years of life, right? So this, this uh, time, this is the time when the 90% of brain growth occurs. So the providing good nutrition during this period is very important. And uh, there are many myths around this good nutrition, like uh, in pregnancy or postpartum or when feeding a child. There are many myths in India like uh, you should not feed heat foods to child or there you should not give uh, this to, uh, this protein to like pulses and all to postpartum mother or pregnant mom this might lead to abortions this might lead to uh, uh, pus formation after uh, in cesarean section so there are myths around nutrition also which are stopping from proper balanced diet right so always a balanced diet is a combination of carbohydrates proteins fats and uh, vitamins and minerals so when all these are there in our food, then it is called a balanced diet. And we all know there are some food groups like uh, whole grains is one food group, like pulses is one food group and uh, dairy is one food group. Uh, uh, fruits and vegetables are one food group. So all these food groups have to be in our plate, in our child's plate so that we can create a good nutritionist meal to the child. So there is first thing we should know is all should be in a balanced proportion. Okay, so like uh, how much of whole grains, how much of protein, how much of vegetables and uh, 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 fruits we have to include in the diet, how much of dairy we have to include in the diet. All this is important. So with these, we can create a nutritionist meal. So one fourth of each of it, like if you take a plate as a circle, if one fourth of each of it creates a balanced diet. So that is an easy way to explain to any mom. Uh, so try to include, include at least two portions of fruits and three portions of vegetables in your child's diet to provide essential vitamins and minerals. And try to give whole grains instead of all processed, uh, processed flours or processed food. Try to give whole grains to your child and try to add pulses and ratio to whole grains like they say three is to one is the ideal ratio of cereals and pulses so try to add it in the same ratio so that it gives a proper protein to uh, your child so this is how we have to uh, give a balanced nutritionist meal to a child okay 
This so, is wonderful. Yes, yes, please continue, Doc. Uh, yes, and there are myths around the dairy also. Like some say we should not give dairy because they're contaminated, they're adulterated, and uh, uh, they are causing early puberty and all. Some say giving dairy, uh, that, that is what I think it is in Hindi. And in Telugu, they say, Palatana Pillal Perutaru. That is the word they use generally. So they think only milk will increase the height and weight of the child. And say, so most of the diets in children will be, half of it would be milk. They would be feeding their children 500 ml to 1 liter of milk. So that both of the, both are not correct. So after one year of age, it is just 300 ml of milk, which is milk or dairy products. That is curd, paneer, everything, which is required for child's diet. But there are two myths, which both of them have to be busted. So creating a rounded meal or balanced diet is including all the five food groups I have mentioned and including all the carbohydrates, proteins, minerals and fat content equally in the diet. So this, these two are very important. Perfect. So I think the takeaway for parents is that A, include the five food groups. And B, take a plate and divide it into one-fourth and you know how much of quantity of each a child should be getting for a wholesome meal, a balanced meal. I think that those are the wonderful takeaways that parents would definitely benefit from. My next question to you, Doc, is that parents are very worried about children's cognitive growth, you know, intelligence, cognitive yeah. development, etc. Does food play an important part in this? Is there any specific dietary component that is crucial for cognitive growth in children? Yeah, first thing, as I mentioned, the first thousand days are very important. Providing good nutrition during this thousand days helps very much in uh, producing a smart child, definitely, uh, because the 90% of brain growth occurs during this stage. And second thing is there is no uh, uh, one drug or one pill or one food that will help in brain growth. It is always a it is always a, a balanced diet which gives a good brain growth. But there are some superfoods which helps in uh, increasing the cognitive capacity or providing good brain growth, like omega three fatty acids. Uh, these can be obtained from walnuts, flax seeds, or uh, fish. So uh, depending upon the cultural diversities, any uh, these can be included in in their diet. And the second one being uh, uh, Moringa uh, because it is very rich in antioxidants uh, and it is rich in, uh, uh, rich in uh, calcium uh, antioxidants which help in brain growth and which help also helps in anti-cancer and anti-aging uh, effects. So uh, there are some superfoods like this which can be added in this child's diet and this can cause an increase in the cognitive function. And the third thing being iron. Iron is very important for cognitive function of the child. So, and in India, we see that almost 70% of children are iron deficient. So, yes. iron is rich, uh, I mean, foods rich in iron should be included in the diet of the child. And also, iron absorption increases when vitamin C rich foods are added in the diet. So we should add I vitamin C rich foods also in the diet. So iron rich foods, vitamin C rich foods, omega-3 fatty acids, antioxidants, which are present in tomato, moringa, all these things can help in increase in the brain growth. So it is all uh, like balanced diet and including the superfoods in uh, child's diet. There is no single medicine or pill or food which will alone increase the cognitive function. Well, well said. I am so happy that they will hear it from you because otherwise uh, parents do sometimes get a little confused and carried away that uh, when all these advertisements say that feed this to your child and your child will become intelligent, etc. Yeah. You know? uh, mm -hmm. No amount of packaged foods are ever going to make your child intelligent. So I'm so happy that you shared that the four important things are iron, omega-3, antioxidants, and vitamin C. 
And I'm sure you will also agree with me when I say that vitamin C available in Tetra Pak juices is not vitamin it's not, C. No, 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 that's not vitamin C. Vitamin <laughs> C available in Goa, lemon, amla is vitamin C. <laughs> exactly. I'm glad you said that because a lot of parents I know nowadays feel that uh, juice tetra pack mein jo aata hai, wo juice hota hai. I said it is not juice. Anything that has additives in it is not good for your not children. Good. So I'm glad that you said that. So let's go to our next section now. And uh, the section is on uh, effects of sugar intake on attention and learning. And I am so happy that we are including this section because uh, my question to you is the correlation between sugar intake and the effect that it has on children's attention and learning capabilities. Is there any connection between sugar and children's attention and learning? Uh, yeah, there are many studies done on this aspect. Because uh, previously there was one myth that sugar was leading to uh, was the cause for uh, ADHD and autism and learning difficulties. Uh, but uh, it is proven that sugar has an effect on child, like increasing the hyperactivity and increasing the inactiveness in, in inattention, inattention or inattentiveness in the child. But sugar doesn't. Sugar is not related to ADHD and autism. That means uh, sugar, eating sugar alone is not going to cause the child ADHD or autism, but it is definitely going to cause hyperactivity and uh, inattention in the child. Okay. All these sugar-based drinks and sugar, uh, excessive consumption of sugar because of processed food, packaged food, uh, these are the reasons for excessive intake of sugar. As a, as a such, if you see a normal diet which is cooked at home, I don't think we'll use maximum two to four spoons of sugar in in any diet, right? In a, any homemade or home cooked meals. Uh, generally, a lot sugar for two to 18 years of age of child is, that is from two years to 18 years is, six teaspoons of sugar per day is enough. That is 25 okay. grams of sugar is enough. But if you see any packed food, First, suppose if you see any packaged drinks or if you see any health drinks uh, mixes which are used in uh, milk and all, we see that it is even one spoon is more than uh, 50 grams. So, uh, so it's like limiting sugar is important. That is a point, a key home message to be taken. And yes, definitely sugar has many side effects. Uh, like first side effect on cognitive function is increasing hyperactivity and increasing inattentiveness. But more than this, it has an effect on uh, causing obesity in chain, which is very dangerous now and in future also. In future also, they can be prone to hypertension, diabetes. And uh, we are seeing many cases of fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in children nowadays. Previously, it was there in adults, but nowadays we are seeing in children also. That means uh, the cause is sugar, obviously, right? So, there are many other yeah. things also yeah. sugar can cause. So, limiting sugar is very important in children. Excellent. I'm uh, so happy that you said it. And other thing is, I feel limiting processed food and packaged foods or food brought from outside will limit the sugar itself. <laughs> sugar in the type of itself absolutely i think you know when you and i were uh, brought up by our parents i remember when a chocolate was brought in the house each one of us got a piece nowadays yeah, it's a whole bar of chocolate for every <laughs> child you know yeah, it, yes. it starts there you know it, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not about what i can afford for my child it's about yeah. is that good for my child you know that's true that's true. Excellent. Excellent. So I come to my next question, which is tied to this, because a lot of parents find it very difficult to control the sugar intake. So what are the mitigative strategies or alternatives that parents can consider to manage sugar consumption effectively? Uh, actually, first one is what you said, like do not bring it in, in, into the house. Okay. So 
I whenever a patient complains to me, uh, like my child is having many chocolates, my child is having many ice creams, my child is having chips or, or something like that, I ask who bought it. <laughs> it's definitely the parent. Uh, so we should role model definitely because children learn from us. Uh, but I know it might be hard for some. Uh, maybe they're, they're having that. Uh, crave, uh, cravings or maybe they're having a disease which which increases the craving so first we should model the behavior to the child and second is we should not bring the uh, bring uh, or we should be careful or we should be reading the labels of whatever we are getting into the house right these two are in our hands Absolutely. the third how to limit sugar in already uh, a child who is consuming a lot that that is when alternatives come into place that is we can use jaggery in place of sugar i know yeah. jaggery and sugar are of same calories but this is less processed and this has more minerals in it okay, okay. and uh, there are many fruits which are very sweet and which can replace sugar for example banana uh, if, when the, whenever the child is asking for a sweet or something if the child is craving for chocolate pancakes we can make chocolate and banana added instead of sugar right uh, so try to replace it uh, whenever possible with uh, jaggery banana dates powder or dates offering them dates as a snack or date as a chocolate uh, offering them a small piece of jaggery as a chocolate uh, yes. is better to avoid uh, uh, like chocolates ice creams and all these things so we uh, we these three things are very important modeling the behavior not get reading the labels of the foods you are getting into the house and third thing is trying to make an alternative uh, recipe instead of using sugar use other alternatives and make the recipe that is how we try to absolutely and reading the labels as you said is so important because yeah. nowadays they hide different kinds of sugars under different names and if you will notice that 50% of the content of that particular thing all the ingredients were sugar so it is very yeah. very important to read labels that's a wonderful habit i i urge all parents please develop a habit go to the back of the packet and read the ingredients and modeling behavior reminded me of a story of mahatma gandhi when a parent uh, took a child to mahatma gandhi and said that he's got diabetes but he's just not leaving sugar please talk to him and mahatma gandhi said come after 2 days so the parents were upset why is he calling us after 2 days why can't he speak to my child now so they went after 2 days and they asked that why did you call us after 2 days so mahatma gandhi said i wanted to see what it is to stay without sugar before i can advise your child to stay without sugar yeah. so it is very important that what you will do your child is going to imitate you and model you so i think doc you came out with a wonderful three pointers for parents because sugar is definitely the devil in your child's diet wonderful points wonderful let's go to section 3 now and uh, section 3 is on um, hydration and its importance and this is very important because uh, nowadays i feel not only children even adults are not drinking enough water so my first question to you is how does maintaining proper hydration play a role in sustaining focus and mental agility in children okay uh definitely one thing is like if you are deficient in water or if you are less hydrated what happens is supply to the vital organs i mean the blood flow or the ox uh, water supply will decrease which can cause some slight dizziness or uh, uh, what do you say fatigue or tiredness sluggish first symptoms sluggishness these yeah. are the first symptoms so in children obviously they lose focus and they stay un- inattentive they are not uh, fo- uh, focused in class they have learning difficulties all these are the primary issues and uh, if the hydration is even more gone the next thing is they they have severe muscle cramps because they are losing water to the muscles and then they have uh, headaches all these are the symptoms so when there is a severe headache or something or when they are having cramps no one can focus or no one can concentrate right 
so hydration is definitely important because we all know 70% of our body is nothing but water so hydration makes uh, a major role in focusing attention and cognitive function definitely <laughs> oh that's wonderful so I, it's not just that you need to drink water only when you are thirsty you need yeah. to keep yourself hydrated and sometimes children are so busy with their activities that they forget to drink water so it is very yeah. important that parents do keep them hydrated i come to that next point now that uh, can you provide some tips for parents on how yeah. can they ensure that their children stay adequately hydrated especially throughout the day when they are so busy how should parents ensure that children are kept hydrated uh actually first i would like to tell how much amount of water they should give uh one is for less than 6 months definitely no water for less than one year that is 6 months to one year it is around 4 ounces that is 4 30 ml of water have to be given in four uh, parts okay four times okay so they can provide they can make sure they are providing water after half an hour of any meal they are giving or after the milk or something like that and uh, make uh, for 1 to 3 years of age it is four glasses and for this and for eight, above 8 years of age it is like an adult seven to eight glasses of water so But between eight and 6 years of age how much is it One to three, it is uh, four glasses, and three to eight is around five glasses, and oh. around after eight is around uh, seven to eight glasses. Oh. So they require But, five glasses of water in a day, and sometimes yeah. parents get such big, big water bottles, and <laughs> no wonder the children put it all in the plants. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. And uh, uh, other point is like uh, this all depends upon the climatic conditions also. Yes, and uh, yes. the individual needs are also different because some children might be having some problems and some children are uh, it all depends and the water balance is also different in individual people so it all has differences but this is the uh, general consideration i'm telling about okay so this is the amount of water so now how do we uh, make it uh, attractive to the child like how do we provide the child one is you can use infused waters like uh, Uh, use a transparent glass makes make uh, makes um, i mean put some slices of lemon or put some uh, pudina so make it very uh, something colorful like add some uh, uh, i mean add some beetroot juice or something to make it colorful okay so provide some infused drinks which will, right. which will not only make it colorful or attractive but also alters the taste a little bit okay that can be done and you can use uh, different types of cups or different type of water bottles to make it uh, like make it attractive to the child like if your child likes some a cartoon character try to provide a, put a sticker on it and say okay your poo is calling you to uh, drink water something like that so you have to try to make it attractive to the child nowadays <laughs> so uh, other things these two are the uh, uh, one point other thing is try to include uh, water containing vegetables and fruits in their diets okay that is what i can give you like there are many water containing vegetables and fruits like bottle gourd uh, like watermelon like musk melon all these are more water containing and less fiber right so those can be like kira all these can be yes. included in the diet of the child so that the water content will increase uh these are the three tips i can give to a mother to increase the water content in the child the child too okay uh, i think this is wonderful and if i can ask you how much water does an adult require to drink it is 7 to 8 glasses of water in is what adults require and again it depends on Yeah. yeah i ask this because if children don't see you drinking water they are not going to feel like drinking water so i tell this to yes. the teachers also in our schools that drink water in the class so that looking at you children will also drink water in the class and i must share something with parents uh, to make it even more interesting what you can do is maybe make a flower shape for each one of you family members 
and for every glass of water drunk put a uh, raindrop on that flower so at the end of the day count how many raindrops are there on each flower and that makes it into a game and it will really interest children into drinking water the amount of water that they were supposed to drink because if i have completed my raindrops on my water every day then my uh, uh, flower is very happy so wonderful points doc and i'm sure parents will understand that water is a necessity and that's also going to keep your brain child's brain active uh, let's go to the next section now and uh, the title of the section is called uh, supplements ye or nay so we're going to talk about nutritional supplements and their connection to learning or their impact on learning so doc i wanted to ask you should nutritional supplements be used for children and are there any associated risks that parents should be aware of uh this is actually a controversial question <laughs> uh, depends yeah or no uh, yes or no like uh, i would advise i am i don't know i am somehow against supplements mm. like i feel there is uh, uh, we can get all the supplements needed for growth of the child from the food itself exactly from uh, uh, but the, but there is a class here like uh, it should be good well sourced and uh, it should be uh, cooked properly and uh, it should be served prop i mean served yes. properly and consumed by child in right amounts yes if all this is done properly there is no need of any supplement all of us know this this is a universal do truth but obviously there are problems in procuring the material for cooking and cooking processes are different which are sometimes uh, i mean breaking the nutrients or losing the nutrients in the food and uh, the amount of food the child consumes also might not be sufficient to provide the proper supplements to the body so uh, if you try to source it from good sources and cook it properly and Uh, if the child has right amounts i don't think supplements are necessary supplements so, so doctors my, vote nay yeah my vote is no but uh, if there are any signs and deficiencies uh, symptoms we should start we have to start because uh, if these if all these are happening correctly why 70% of children in india are iron deficient why right. there are why there is 42% of malnutrition i mean obesity or undernutrition in chil- in children obesity i call mal uh, obesity is also a malnutrition right yes it so, is it is yeah so there is a problem in it definitely in children so when all these are there yes supplement plays a role but i feel supplement should be given only when discussed and uh, analyzed after proper examination with a doctor uh, okay. just taking a, a supplement because it was recommended to other child in the class and uh, thinking that supplement will cause uh, a good cognitive function or make my child smart or make my child beautiful uh, i don't think those supplements are necessary Absolutely. it is always really categorized not definitely or generalized category of supplement is not available so basically com- uh, uh, can supplements be considered as complementary uh complementary uh, no definitely not uh, instead of i feel if if your child have to be getting your vitamin c per day i don't think giving a supplement of a uh, tablet or a syrup is the solution you Absolutely. know we know that half a goa one uh, half a lemon and half a amla is enough for your child to get the vitamin c requirements for the day right yeah. that this is an example i'm giving like uh, it's enough so i think giving that is better than giving a supplement but at the same time if some child comes to me with a uh, ulcers on the leg or some uh, or some other skin problem or some other wounds which are not healing i have to give them vitamin c supplementation because it is necessary for them so okay. it all 
supplements individually. So I Absolutely. think supplements should not be directly bought from the pharmacy. It should be taken after the advice from the doctor. Absolutely. So which means parents don't go for all these advertisements that you see. Yeah, that that's tablet please give it to your child advertisers are just trying to sell something they are not thinking of the health benefits for your child so that's what doc has very clearly outlined and i loved how brilliantly she has said that half a lemon half a guava and half an amla is all it takes per day to ensure that your child gets its vitamin c uh, requirements for the day so i think if we have these simple mantras it will become so much easier for parents to understand that it's time to give children an organic life rather than giving them a life which is filled with junk food and supplements and stuff like that. Fantastic. Yeah. It was, these were wonderful sections, uh, doctor. And uh, we're now going to, I have some audience questions with me and I'm going to ask you those questions. So the first question that I'm going to ask is, uh, uh, how often should children's nutritional needs be assessed? Because I don't think parents are getting any check done on their child's nutrition needs. So who should parents consult for proper dietary advice for cognitive development? Okay. Uh, so the, how often the child's nutritional needs to be assessed? It's like uh, in one year of life, it depends. Like every three months, the child needs to be assessed because... Uh, the diet is different for six months. The diet is different for seven months, eight months, nine months. So it, it needs, child needs assessment uh, like for 45 days, uh, three months, six months, nine months and one year. This is the assessment uh, time. But after one year, it is like yearly session. Like every okay. year, uh, how do we assess? By height, weight and uh, checking their skin, nails, uh, and uh, hair because these are the places where most of the initial symptoms of vitamin deficiency is present, right? So this is how we assess. So when you assess, that is when we understand, okay, these are the nutritional deficiencies present. This is the early sign where the child is track, uh, track is going down because we monitor using growth charts, right? When we monitor, we, we see a fall. Okay, this year the child has a fall. So why is it due to? Is there this deficiency or that deficiency? And that deficiency needs to be corrected. Okay. So, this definitely parents need to consult a pediatrician for proper uh, nutritional assessment. And then might require a dietitian, pediatric dietitian also for prescription of the uh, nut correct nutrition, uh, nutritional chart. Because it's like, how much calories needed, how much protein this child needs and what are the problems in the vitamin, I mean, deficiencies he's having or what are the problems in growth and development are assessed by the pediatrician. But how many calories a uh, food has and how, how that should be cooked and how that should be fed to the child is uh, detailed uh, told by a dietitian. So okay. definitely parents need to consult both of them pediatrician for assessment and uh, dietitian for the proper diet prescription. Okay. So I connected to this question, when we talk about nutritional needs, there's a common problem that sometimes we see in a classroom where a child removes the paint or the, uh, you know, from the wall and uh, eats it. So is yeah, that yeah. a sign of some deficiency? Definitely. That is called a spica. Pika is eating abnormal foods which are not to be eaten, right? Like uh, taking a paint, uh, eating paint, eating chalk, eating mud. These are the common symptoms which are seen in iron deficiency anemia. So that is a symptom of deficiency of iron. So these children, if they're treated properly with proper iron supplements, they recover from that problem in two months. Okay, great. Now, I uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, and I think this question is also something something that uh, India is suffering from. We have a lot of high blood pressure patients in this country. So the question is, what is the ideal amount of salt consumption that parents should maintain for their child? Okay. Uh, according to the guidelines, what they say is, in, uh, do not introduce any salt in less than one year of age. 
okay and uh, minimal amount of salt in one to two years of age minimal amount is 0.5 grams per day okay and after one year of age oh, sorry after two years of age it is like one gram per day is the salt requirement which a child requires per per day okay so restricting so means... and limiting salt is important because it prevents uh, future hypertension future uh, i mean retention yeah. of water and obesity and future hypertension definitely so which means uh when i'm taking my child to the movie theater and i give him this large popcorn salted popcorn popcorn oh my god that's much more than the salt requirement of my child so it that's is definitely. ridiculous what we are feeding our children yeah it's always like uh, the lesser amount you get from outside or the lesser amount you uh, of food you have through packaged items or outside food and more amount of home processed food that is when yeah. that is the ideal or good balanced rounded diet which we can provide to our child absolutely we should not Nowadays, fall for the fake advertisements as you are all, always mentioning on the uh, every session yes yes because i think uh, advertisers have become very smart now they play on the emotions of parents Oh, and uh, they make them buy those kind of things because there is some amount of guilt in parenting and they feel that that guilt will be mitigated if i buy this product for my child not realizing that they are actually adding to the health problems of their children so this That's is uh, salt is something parents i appeal to all of you all please be careful of the salt content that your child is consuming because that's going to have long term repercussions on your child's health let's go to the next question that has come from a parent and which is i think a very common question that most parents have uh, the question is my child is very picky with food and it's difficult to feed him a balanced diet how do i tackle this okay uh, so uh, whenever a question question like this is asked by a parent i think two things are the reason one thing is either that parent is back of the child always overfeeding him distraction feeding him and uh, uh, this these these are the most common causes and the second thing is the guilt mom guilt you have spoken about or uh, the feeling that a mom is never satisfied I, as a mom even i am not satisfied always like whenever my child eats this much i was like okay you can eat some more i am like you can eat some more uh, so that type of overfeeding distraction feeding are the reasons for most of the picky eating nowadays okay your child has picky eating enough how do i tackle this uh, first thing is we have to see the growth of the child uh, so is the child growing properly like is the weight height normal for the age okay if the weight and height is normal for the age you just can make minor changes like uh, uh, like like trying to make all the food healthy and trying to make even a small amount energy dense like adding a ghee or coconut oil or nut powders or uh, jaggery all these to increase the energy density of the food in small amounts okay so making the food energy dense and feeding them and making food attractive to them and knowing what they like and adding Eight, uh, 75% of the food should be what they like. 25% of the plate should be what they do not like or what you want to introduce to them. Okay. So these are the three points I would recommend: energy dense, making the food attractive, and uh, uh, making it like uh, 75% what they don't like and 25% and of what you want to introduce. And the uh, uh, fourth point would be like. including them in all the activities like uh, preparation of the food like uh, taking them to grocery stores to get the food like uh, okay do you want to eat carrot curry today so what do we need for carrot make, making a carrot curry so we have to buy carrots we have to buy onions so let's uh, peel the onions let's uh, peel the eggs these are the small things which children can do and which uh, which makes them inclusive about food and which makes uh, which makes them draw again uh, to foot okay so this will help us so these are the four points i would advise for who are maintaining the weight and height 
and uh, and the parents feel as picky eaters but there is another category where there's there is a serious picky eating problem like the child doesn't maintain weight and height uh, the child has issues sitting down to eat the child has uh, child is not passing urine or not pa- uh, having problems with the motion all these children fall into a category where they need assessment because we have seen issues like simple tongue tie interfering with feeding uh, we have seen issues with a palate where uh, where they have problems with the palate or weak muscles around the uh, mouth or weak uh, problems inside which are causing the problem outside like the symptom is picky eating so okay. these are the children with who needs assessment complete assessment by a pediatrician and that problem if addressed properly the picky eating solution is gone okay, okay. even a simple behavioral problems like adhd autism are might also present as picky eating so uh, so there are two types organic cause of picky eating uh, that is there is some cause which is causing pic- uh, disease which is causing picky eating so find out the disease treat it uh, by an expert and then your picky eating is gone one thing where your height cha- uh, child is growing well but you think there is picky eating follow those four steps <laughs> and i love it how you always given four steps three steps two steps <laughs> it's so easy for parents to remember and yeah. uh, you know it will be something that they will want to do and i'm sure parents can keep watching this interview again and again if they have missed out on some points but i will i will end this uh, question by saying the food should not run behind the child the child should run behind the food behind the food that's exactly what the doc nice wants to say. yes so my next question which is from one of our viewers is uh, do foods like almonds walnuts actually help with brain development uh, what is the right age for them uh, actually uh, in simple words yes definitely almonds and walnuts help in brain growth uh, brain uh, cognitive function uh, it can be started from 6 months of life also like uh, these but it should not be given as a whole nut because they have choking hazard it's a choking hazard so it should not be giving given as a whole nut in less than 3 year old more than 3 years yes you can give so nuts it's not a problem but less than 3 years it should be grinded it should be roasted and grinded or soaked and grinded and added to your purees or whatever you're feeding your child it can be added in the food and it can be given as a, a milk mix anyway right. okay that's wonderful well i also eat a lot of almonds uh so it's good to know that it's good for the brain uh, <laughs> yes it's good for the brain and uh, next question ha uh, yes no 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 it's okay walnuts are the only uh, vegetarian source of omega 3 fatty acids There. walnuts have black seeds yeah yes and you said omega 3 is very good for the brain, brain. so yes excellent yes so walnuts and uh, almonds parents please add it in your shopping list and ensure that in this you don't add salted almonds and peppermint almonds and all that please no no adulterated almonds and walnuts please give them pure almonds and walnuts only then that's going to have a benefit our next question from a parent is something that you've already covered but i would like to ask it it says that my child loves sweets and there are sweet foods that are actually good for him or should i cut them out completely uh i already told you uh, it's like uh, i'll provide them alternatives to sweet if your child yes. likes sweet yes. uh, try to give them sweet fruits or sweet uh, vegetables like uh, you can add banana in his diet you can add apple in his diet and uh, you can provide alternative sugars like uh, jaggery or dates but even jaggery you have to limit it's not like you can give how much you want but it should it should be in a limited moderate amounts okay and dates are good alternative to sweetened food sweet foods or sweet cravings so these can be provided to the child definitely okay. high sugars are not good for a child uh, the recommended yeah that's true absolutely you were saying something about recommended 
Yeah, the recommended amount of sugar a, a child can take per day is 25 grams and that is 6 teaspoons. 6 teaspoons, <laughs> not more than that. Teaspoons, yeah. Teaspoons. <laughs> not tablespoons. <Absolutely. laughs> Yeah, not tablespoons. Okay. And uh, in fact, at uh, Podar Prep, doctor, uh, we have banned cakes, chocolates and sweets during birthday celebrations. That's we don't nice. allow, yes, we don't allow children to distribute them. We don't allow cakes on the premises. Uh, if the children want to distribute something, it will have to be a fruit. So oh, we nice. only allow fruits during birthday celebrations. And this is because... When I was doing my course in Rudolf Steiner Education, which is Waldorf Education, uh, the Waldorf School of Thought believes that uh, the more sugar consumption in the body uh, bypasses the function of the liver. So the liver becomes sluggish. And that's why children should not have too much of sugar content in their nutrition, which is what you have stressed so much. And I'm sure parents would understand it coming from an expert like you. I'm going to ask you the last question, which is every parent's problem these days. Should children be fed in front of a television or with a mobile phone in their hands? Is it harmful for them? Yeah, distraction feeding is obviously harmful. That is what I have told you earlier also. Like distraction feeding is the cause for picky eating also. So many parents that that is better and that is preventing picky eating but you are feeding the child and he is not knowing what he is eating and it just going into the gut but not visualizing or not uh, satisfying the satiety. So definitely distraction feeding is very bad for child. I am so happy you said that because it's become a trend now that my child doesn't eat, so I put my child in front of a television, but it's a merry-go-round. Yeah, it's a merry-go-round. Your child doesn't eat, so you put him in front of the TV, you put him in front of the TV, so he's not going to eat. So That's it's a merry-go-round you will have to get out of. And there was so much, so many takeaways from our talk today. I'm sure parents have made notes and uh, uh, taken down a lot of your ideas. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sri Mukhiji. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you on our first masterclass. And uh, it was uh, uh, very interesting to understand from you about the pivotal role of nutrition, uh, especially in the growing brains of young children. So thank you so much for being with us here today. And thank you for sharing all the wonderful nuggets of uh, information that you gave us. Thank you, Dr. Swati. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.